Hello everyone and welcome to this first in a series of short videos as part of your online uh, learning around HIV. I mentioned in the brief introduction to myself that I started working in HIV client care back in the 1980s and they really were seen as the, the bad old days. Quite often working on the ward, which was an HIV inpatient ward at St Mary's in Paddington, we'd often get about maybe six of our clients a week who died because of an AIDS-defining illness. So I wanted to show how talking about HIV now today is completely different. It's as if we're on a, on a new planet. So although there's still no treat, uh, there's no um, cure for AIDS and there's no vaccine against HIV, nevertheless, the treatment that's being used today is so spectacular compared to the nothing we had in the past, that I must start this presentation off uh, in a really positive way. And that's what I want to do for you all now. A term that you might see used, especially if you're on Twitter, is something called U equals U. Back in those 1980s, we, we'd never even thought of this combination of letters. So if you're on Twitter, it would be hashtag U, then the word equals U. And what that stands for is undetectable equals uninfectious. Because once the virus is in a person's body, and we'll, we'll look at this in one of the later videos, once the virus is in a per person's body, it goes up to certain levels in the blood. So that's referred to as the viral load. But the medication today, if a person's on it nice and early, it can be so um, effective in getting that viral load down really, really low, that once it reaches a certain level and goes below that, that's referred to as undetectable. So the test kits looking for the virus now today um, can only reach it if it's above a certain level. So anything below that is undetectable. And once a person is undetectable, they're now considered to be uninfectious from the point of view of passing on the virus, um, especially through sex. So something we could have never thought about before. This is spectacular news. And in fact, there's more good news as well, because in the 1980s and 90s, the only way um, to pass, uh, the only way to stop passing HIV from one person to another was preventing certain body fluids going from one person and into another. And that's what we'll explore in the next video. OK, and the main ones were from a man. It would be his semen and to a much lesser extent from a woman from her vaginal secretions. So the first picture here shows condoms and condoms are still effective now today. They're a magnificent barrier against HIV. But they also double up as being a magnificent protection against all other sexual infections as well. So chlamydia, syphilis, gonorrhea, so many of these other uh, um, uh, infections which are spread through condomless sex, and that's the preferred term to use, condomless sex, um, so many of those can be prevented by using a condom because it works as a barrier. Okay, so condoms are a really good proven way to prevent passing HIV. Another really good way it is from the World Health Organization, a department called UN AIDS, United Nations AIDS. And their slogan is 909090. And I'll show you that on another slide as well. What that refers to is if the whole world tried to take this on board, it means that HIV as an epidemic, that's an infection amongst a certain number of people in a country, or a pandemic across the world, would actually fizzle out by the year 2030. And if the whole world did this, HIV could be eradicated. Sadly, not all countries are playing ball on this, and it means that the infections are still going up in some parts of the world, which means it's delaying this um, eradication by 2030. And what the UN AIDS wants us to do is work for 90-90-90. And that means if 90% of people living with HIV are tested, and if 90% of those who are tested are put on medication immediately, 
and if 90% of those achieve undetectable viral levels as quickly as possible, then that means HIV can be eradicated from our planet. Okay, a really ambitious goal, 90-90-90. Only recently, UNAIDS have brought out another 90 as well, because stigma is a real problem against pe people with HIV. And that goes from everything, from... Um, uh, preventative measures right through to accessing treatment and care. So the next 90 is to reduce stigma around HIV to at least 90%. Okay. Now you can see that part of that 90 is to do with testing and there's a picture of Prince Harry. When Prince Harry goes for testing, um, testing increases right across the UK. So he's a great ambassador, like his mother, the late Princess Diana. He's a great ambassador around HIV. So certainly for encouraging more people to be tested. In those early days of HIV, because there were no effective treatments, then what was the point of being tested? It would just raise people's stress levels, knowing that they were infected and what could be done about it. So in those days, testing was referred to as exceptional. It was only few people who would be tested. Now it's moved from exceptionalization to normalization. So especially in midwifery services, HIV testing is now routine. It's the norm. And midwifery services may have a big sign up saying, we routinely test everyone. If you don't want to be tested, please opt out. So people are opting out instead of opting into testing. OK, so that's normalizing it. Now, you could say that if normalization happened in more places, say, for example, in GP practices, um, accident and emergencies, pre-theater for every single person, then that would make it so much more normal um, for everyone to accept HIV testing. And what that could help to do is to detect those um, still a small number of people who are what, what are referred to as late presenters. And that may be people who didn't consider themselves to be at risk of HIV, or maybe some people, possibly because of stigma, who bury their heads in the sand and do not want to be tested. And therefore, when HIV has a negative impact on their body, they leave it for a number of years, and by that time they become so ill, they develop an AIDS-defining illness. So when they go into hospital, severely ill, with an AIDS-defining illness, they're diagnosed both as having an AIDS indicator condition, an AIDS illness, and that obviously means they've got underlying HIV. Okay, So they would be re referred to as late presenters. Prince Harry is really helping to combat late presenters. The next two elements, you will see two words used here, PEP and PrEP. PEP came out in about the year 2000 and it stands for post-exposure prophylaxis. Now the word prophylactic is an ancient Greek word which literally means a soldier's shield. If they're standing there with a shield on, that's protecting them. It's a prophylactic. And in some languages, even the word prophylactic is used for a condom. You can walk into a pharmacy and ask for a prophylactic, and that means a condom. OK, so post-exposure prophylaxis means you're taking the uh, prevention after the event has happened. So you could say that emergency contraception is a form of post-exposure prophylaxis. You're taking the prevention after the event. OK, so post-exposure prophylaxis has been around since about 2000 in relation to HIV and it first started off for healthcare professionals. Say, for example, if somebody had a needle stick injury and they were at risk of HIV, they would be started on a month's supply of the anti-HIV drugs and that would be treated then as post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is still available now. But also it's been widened out to sexual access. So if somebody has 
um, a risk of HIV through unprotected sex, through condomless sex, they can access post-exposure prophylaxis as well. Now, the message is try and start it as quickly as possible after the incident. If you can start it within the first hour, that's wonderful. It can be taken for up to 72 hours later, started up to 72 hours later, but the quicker you start it in relation to the, the core incident, the more effective it will be. And it needs to be taken for 28 days. This is not like emergency contraception. This is a one month supply of treatment. Okay, So that if the virus has got into a person's body, post-exposure prophylaxis will work by stopping it infecting certain blood cells. And we'll look at those in the next video. Okay, that's PEP. Now, PrEP is more recent. That's only over the last couple of years. And that stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. That means, supposing you have a couple where one of them has got HIV, which is detectable, and the other one hasn't. They would be referred to as a serodiscordant couple. So serum is blood. So if HIV is in a person's blood, and if they're opposites, so one is HIV positive, one's HIV negative, they would be referred to as serodiscordant. If they're both the same, so both HIV negative or both HIV positive, that's seroconcordant. Okay? So supposing you've got an HIV discordant couple, and maybe they always have intercourse using condoms, but on this one occasion the condom is broken or it slipped off, or they forgot to use it, whatever the, the issue. Therefore, if the person without HIV is now at risk, they um, can access post-exposure prophylaxis. But if they decide, well, they're going to take this risk anyway, then the person who has not got HIV can be taking the medication before the incident happens. And that's pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the World Health Organization says that every single person who has a need for this should have it free on prescription. Every single person. If you live in Scotland or in Wales, that's what the situation would be. You could go along to a sexual health clinic, say that you have need of pre-exposure prophylaxis, and you'll be given a prescription for it. Sadly, in England, because of politics, it's not working that way. NHS England has spent hundreds of thousands of pounds, wasted it, by going to court on two occasions to argue that they shouldn't fund pre-exposure prophylaxis. The courts decided, yes, NHS England should fund it. So rather than making it freely available for everyone who needs it, they said, well, oh, come on, let's do some more research. So they've put 10,000 people on a research study. So only those 10,000 people can access PrEP. They've recently broadened that out to 20,000 people, but that still isn't enough. And there are certain individuals who are missing out on this altogether. The majority of those are women, and especially women of colour. And many of these may not realise they have a need for PrEP, and therefore they're not accessing the research whereby they'd be on the trial. Okay? So this is a political decision um, and it's also a waste of money because the amount that NHS England would be spending on PrEP is tiny in comparison to paying for someone to be on anti-HIV medication for the duration of their lives. Okay, So that's a really important point. The final element showing on this slide, in fact there's a small typo on there, it should say treatment as prevention. So if you want to abbreviate it, it's a capital T, small as and a capital P, TASP, treatment as prevention. And what that means is, if people living with HIV are put onto medication as quickly as possible, not only is it treating them, so they will now live as long as they ever would have lived. That's how good the treatment has become. So it's still not a cure, but it's a fantastic treatment, and people will live as long as they would have throughout life. But it's doing that by making the viral load go really low, so it's undetectable. So, on the one hand, 
it's good to their own bodies because they're stopping the virus causing damage. So it's treatment for them. But by getting the viral load as undetectable, it also means there's no onward transmission to others. So this is treatment as prevention. OK. Here's that slide about 1990 and right across the UK, especially since, since the second slide came out, we're now doing much better. So right across, um, well, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, England, Wales and Scotland, we're now achieving 90, 90, 90 and we're going over and above that. So we're doing really well. But that's not a call for complacency because there are still people who have not been diagnosed and therefore they're not on the medication. So we still need to increase testing venues and testing opportunities and also to encourage more countries around the world to go for this as well. So that was to set the scene in a really positive way for this online learning I'm sharing with you. So the overall intended learning outcome for this, the aim is to explore some of these contemporary issues related to HIV infection and disease, and especially looking at ways in which you can make a positive impact on the clients that you deal with. So whichever field of practice you're working in, let's see how we can customise this for your own field of practice and the individual outcomes that we'll achieve. First of all, to explain in the next video the modes of transmission of HIV. So you'll notice once you finish this video, there's a quick quiz, a couple of slides on the Adobe Spark website for you to have a look at. Please work through those, consider your answers, and then watch the next video, okay? And that'll explore the primary modes. So what's the main way the main ways in which HIV goes from one person to another. And once you know those, you'll then know how to block those ways. So you'll know about primary prevention as well. Then we'll look at um, the impact on a person's immune system and on their body as a whole. So if the virus does get into an individual, what does it actually do uh, within their, their body? And then finally, uh, in, the, in, in the last video, to draw this together for yourselves, whichever field of practice you're in, saying, right, what, what difference can you make? How can you do something positive around this? I hope you're going to enjoy this online learning. Um, but I really apologise for my voice. I'm suffering badly with bronchitis at the moment. OK, hope you've enjoyed this and this little video is ending here. Thanks.